Blue Origin um, with Jeff Bezos. Um, and then Inspiration4 as well. That was another one that went around the moon. Uh, sorry, went around the earth. Um, so that was in 2021. And not so many in 2022 because they calmed the commercial stuff down. But you can actually get more people on the um, the Crew Dragon now. So instead of taking the three people and squeezing them into the soils, they can get four people into the uh, the Crew Dragon and send them up. So they they make use of getting more people up there with less flights. <clears throat> so that's that's the state of play in, the, in terms of activity. Uh, a quick review of some of the um, uh, missions that took place during that time. So we've got the the, the James Webb gave us our, its first light images. Um, uh, Perseverance, uh, the rover that's on Mars, dropped its first um, sample tube, so waiting for collection. The capstone, which is going around the moon, um, simulating the um, uh, the lunar gateway. We have the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I have to touch on that because it had, it did, did have a heavy influence on the space industry. Um, Artemis, uh, that uh, was a real success finally uh, when it went up. So uh, it was due to go up middle of 2022 um, due to a few uh, leaks that they had in the engine. Then um, they delayed it and eventually it went up and came back and it was a complete success. Uh, the Dart Impact. And also the um, the uncrewed test of the uh, Boeing Starliner. So the James Webb Space Telescope sent back its first images, and we were all waiting in bated breath on the uh, the 12th of July when they said they were going to announce it. But then they were going to announce a special one the night before on the 11th of July, and everybody sat round the NASA website listening to some really really random hold music that did sound like we were on hold from nasa so if you were there you would know exactly what i mean and i think it's worse than the uh, the music that they played during the virgin orbit launch although ooh, it's, it's touch and go either way uh, but eventually we did see this picture at the top here this is the one that was unveiled by the uh, uh president joe biden um and it's webb's first deep field of the uh the galaxy cluster SMACS0723, and there's lots and lots of detail in there, as you can see. Um, then the following day, on the 12th of July, we had the other four that were released. You've got Stefan's Quintet, uh, which is uh, a group of five galaxies. That's in the top middle there then. And for me, the top right one is the images of all images I used. I loved this one um, of the, uh, the Carina Nebula. Uh, and then in the bottom left, they did uh, two different camera um, uh, settings for the uh, the NGC 3132 of the Southern Ring Nebula. And then NASA also, uh, the, the, the Webb Telescope, also captured a distinct uh, signature of water uh, with evidence of cloud and haze in the atmosphere. And you can see that there's the, uh, the, the evidence of it down there. So yes, so we had our very first pictures back from the James Webb Space Telescope. And boy, have they kept coming over 2022 and i'm sure they will do over the next uh, uh life lifetime of the james webb capstone then so capstone this is a um a cubesat that's simulating the um orbit of the lunar gateway uh, just to make sure because it's a, a special type of orbit uh known as an uh, a near rectilinear halo orbit or nrho um and, and it maximizes um, the gravity pull between the Earth and the Moon and the Sun. Um, it also makes sure that they're, it, you're facing the Earth at any time, so there's no blackout for communications. And also it makes sure that part of it goes very, very close to the lunar surface uh, during its orbit so that they can easily use the um, lander to go up and down. So it's launched in uh, June 2022. Uh, and um, it took it's gone on a three month trip to the moon and then it will spend six months there collecting data so sort of middle of um, sort of easter time summer time we'll start getting some results from that so this is this nrho orbit i was telling you about so it goes round the moon and comes close to the surface so that they can use that to uh, go up and down so that there's no uh, loss of space it goes round the uh, um, uh, moon that way, so that there's always um, communication between that and the Earth. And of course, it makes use of the uh, uh, the balance between the Earth and the moon orbits, so that it can be in a stable orbit and use um, very little fuel. 
The Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, so that released the first of its 17 titanium tubes filled with uh, Mars material that's been collected by the rover itself, and that's now resting safely on the surface of Mars. As you can see there, there's a close-up there that I can see, and doesn't it look like a lightsaber from Star Wars? That's what I always think when I look at it. Um, so it collected the... Um, uh, the, the um, the sample. Uh, it was an igneous rock nicknamed Malay, uh, located in the south of the Jezero crater, um, a place called, um, you can see it on there, Setai. Uh, and it picked it up on the 31st of January 2022, and then it drove all the way around uh, and deposited it round here in a place called Three Forks. And over the next two months or so, it's going to be human's first deposit site on another planet um, that will grow up to about 10, a total of 10 sample tubes uh, deposited on the surface in that area called Three Forts, uh, ready for collection. And that's a mission for the future, which um, uh, we'll cover no doubt at, uh, at some point in, in some of these future presentations. Um, I have to touch on the, uh, the space industry with Russia versus the rest of the world because the invasion of Russia did have a, a heavy influence on the space industry. So as you can see here, I've done a, a little mini timeline of from when they invaded it, 24th of February last year, which is nearly a year away. That is, that is phenomenal if you think how fast time flies. And I've gone up to sort of the 16th of April, so you can see um, the, the, the key events that have... Um, of, uh, affected the space industry during that time. Um, Joe Biden made a, a speech about Putin being the aggressor, and he mentioned in there about uh, sanctions, and he's saying that it will degrade the aerospace industry, including their space program. So it's the only, only time in that speech that he mentioned about the space program, and the, uh, the Russian uh, space agency's director came back with, do you want to destroy our cooperation with the ISS? Uh, if you block it, we'll do an uncontrolled uh, deorbiting of all on the United States or Europe because it doesn't fly over, because uh, of its orbital inclination, it doesn't fly over uh, Russia. So they had a little bit of a, a hand in that, uh, a little bit, little bit of an ace up their sleeve. Um, the first response came from Germany um, with this uh, mission called uh, E-Resita. Uh, it's, it's, uh, they switched off this black hole telescope that's on board a Russian satellite. Um, it was launched in 2019 from Baikonur uh, Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. And the, the mission is a jointly funded mission by the German Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency. Um, but the Germans switched the, uh, the telescope off. Um, they also halt, uh, halted the, uh, the Soyuz capsule or the Soyuz launches in French Guyana. So Soyuz is a, a, a Russian launcher, but the um, Ariane Space and uh, ESA use it a lot because it's a nice mid-range launcher. Um, uh, they've got two others, the Vega, but that's too small for some things. And, and the Ariane is just too big for other things. And it, it, it's just it's a nice mid-range one for, for, for the Soyuz. Um, and the European Space Agency, um, they wanted to launch all of these missions on it. As you can see there, there was one called Earthcare Science. There's the um, uh, the Euclid, uh, and also the um, the French government wanted to launch this CSO, which is a reconnaissance satellite, all being launched by um, this uh, Soyuz. But unfortunately, um, they withdrew all of their employees and stopped all of the launches. Um, um, so they halted all of those launches, but they also um have rocket engines that they said delivered so russian made rock rd 180 engines are used in the atlas 5 rocket um so that caused them a bit of a problem they did say they had enough rockets to do all of their 22 um existing launches that they had uh, and then everything was going to be moved over to the vulcan centaur which i'll uh, mention in the 2023 review um, but that relied on Jeff Bezos having his B4 rocket engine ready, and there's been lots and lots of delays on that. So we'll see how that pans out over the next 12, 18 months. Uh, another rocket that was uh, a problem was the Antares. So that uses the RD-181, um, and uh, again, that's supplied by um, Russia. And um, 
they didn't have any left, unfortunately. So this, this is kind of a dead rocket at the moment. Uh, we did see one launch, actually, uh, as part of one of our live launches. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to find another uh, a way of getting all of these up to the ISS. So it, used to, it launches the Cygnus, which is a resupply mission to the uh, International Space Station, but SpaceX are able to take up the, uh, the, the slack on that so that there's no break in um, getting supply backwards and forwards. Uh, OneWeb, OneWeb wanting to launch all of their um, uh, rocket, all of their satellites from uh, a Soyuz rocket actually in Baikonur Cosmodrome uh, back in March. Uh, and Russia basically hijacked these and said, no, nope, you're not going to be launching them anywhere else. Uh, I understand that the UK have now got hold of these uh, and they're going to be um, launching them on SpaceX, who are actually a rival company of OneWeb, but SpaceX again helping them out. Um, then there was um, SpaceX Starlink satellites. They've been providing uh, internet access to Ukraine up until the end of February, and um, Russia um, didn't really like that and, and, and took offence that, st that uh, uh, Starlinks were actually helping out the Ukrainians uh, and took it kind of an act of sort of war. Um, there were new trade sanctions that were put through. Uh, during the, uh, the space sector. This was the UK that put these through by uh, the UK Foreign Secretary at the time, Liz Truss, uh, probably a name we're familiar with. I know that name vaguely from somewhere. Um, and um, she put, the UK will prevent exports of aviation and space-related items and technology to Russia, including services such as insurance and reinsurance. And that... Um, really caused uh, a problem with making sure that anything that goes from Russia, um, all of these things then are, won't be insured, which makes it difficult for them to get uh, clearance to go up if your, your satellites aren't insured. Uh, on the 19th of March, three Russian cosmonauts arrived on the ISS, uh, all wearing yellow, and um, everyone was saying, oh, it's because of um, uh, support in the war against Ukraine, but in actual fact, they were wearing the colours of their uh, uh, their university. So their, um, uh, that's nothing to do with the, the, the Ukraine. Um, so the Soyuz has been taken away, but they still, thankfully, we've got the, um, the SpaceX Crew Dragon that since 2020 has been sending um, Americans backwards and forwards to the ISS. Um, and what we really need now is a backup, which will be the Boeing Starliner. Now, it's passed its uncrewed test during uh, 2022, and hopefully the crewed test that it's going to be doing in 2023 will mean that uh, America has got two ways to get backwards and forwards to low Earth orbit. Uh, I'm going to play this. So this is a propaganda video that was done. Um, and just as a uh, an American was going to be coming back due to the um, uh, to Earth on one of the Soyuz capsules, um, you can see in there being loaded. This is what that shows. And then as the um, uh, the capsule is launched, the, it shows that the front end of or the Russian end of the ISS detaches, um, and then the rest of it falls. So. It's a very good propaganda video. I mean, it's taken with a pinch of salt, but it did, it did make the headlines, as you can see there. Um, and the reason why that is significant is because the Russian part of the International Space Station is the, uh, the propulsion side. It provides the power, the life support, uh, and also makes it keep it afloat. So every so often it will give it its um, uh, push to stop it deorbiting. Now, without the Russian propulsion, the ISS would suffer atmospheric drag, and it will take about five years to re-enter um, due to its orbit's inclination. Now, it doesn't fly over Russia, so Russia's not going to be worried, and that's what they were threatening with when um, they were saying, do you really want to uh, have the ISS coming crashing down on you? <coughs> um, there was also a space war between uh, Russia and uh, Starlink again because they accused it of... Um, helping with the uh, the sinking of their uh, their, their battleship, the, the, the Moskva. Um, so caused a little bit of a stir. Uh, and South Korea also suffered as well because there's two um, 
uh, satellites or two rockets that they were trying to use, the Angara and the Soyuz. Uh, they wanted to use the Angara to launch the uh, the, the Compsat 6, uh, and they wanted to use the Soyuz to launch the um, uh, the CAS 500, which was um, uh, sort of a mid-sized satellite that they needed. They wanted to get up there. Um, but they weren't able to do that, so now they're having to find um, another launch partner to get those into space. Also, the lunar program. Um, so next year they're going to be putting uh, the lunar 25 uh, onto on onto the surface of uh, of Mars. It's the first time that they've done it since, as you can see on there, 1976 from the lunar 24. It's called the lunar globe, but they've called it the lunar 25, so that it, it carries on from where they left off before. Um, and it's just going to be a little lander that's got lots of um, um, equipment on it so that they can uh, study the, the surface. And they're going to be ramped up um, with um, size and activity uh, and payload over the next few years. Now, ESA was supposed to make a contribution to this uh, and put some um, instruments on it. But ESA backed out and said, no, we're not going to. And that actually had a knock-on effect to the Open University. Because when I was at the Open University, they were showcasing some of the things that they were doing and getting ready for to go to the moon. Um, so here we are. We've got the uh, the, the prospect, which is um, uh, a lunar prospect mission where it's going to be measuring water and uh, other volatile um, uh, things on the surface. You've got Prosper, Love Me, and um, well, the Deep Space Gateway, the OU were part of, but that's more of a wider project. But these ones were going to be put on payloads like the Lunar 25, these two, um, on, onto those Russian uh, landers. But unfortunately, because they had to pull out, uh, they had to find someone else. But luckily, the Americans are launching uh, the CLPS, a commercial lunar payload service, which is going to be starting in... 2024. Well, the CLPS actually starts next year, but the OU have already bagged some space on some of those in 2024. So it's not lost, which is good. <clears throat> uh, the missions to Venus were also impacted um, because these were uh, joint Russian uh, missions. So unfortunately, they, they, they've had to suspend everything with the, uh, the, the Venera D mission. And probably the biggest upset of all is ExoMars had to be cancelled, uh, which means ESA couldn't put their uh, their uh, Rosalind Franklin rover onto the surface of Mars because the lander itself was a, a Russian-built lander. Um, so they couldn't actually land without it. So uh, they tried to find a new partner as soon as they can. Um, and it was also being launched on a Proton rocket as well, which was a it is a Russian rocket. Um, but they have found another partner, but not in time for the 2026 launch. So that we reckon it's going to go there in 2028, all being well. So not all is lost. We just have to wait a little bit longer. It is third time lucky for for, for, for ESA. So hopefully um, after the Beagle and the Schiaparelli, this one will be a success for them. Um, so future rockets then to try and get us out of this um, uh reliance on the, uh, the, the the Russian technology. Uh, we have the replacement of the Atlas V and the Antares, um, which is uh, this rocket up here. Um, and, and, and that's the Vulcan Centaur, but as I said earlier, it relies on the, uh, the BE-4 engines from um, uh, Jeff Bezos. Uh, and so does this one over here. This is the, uh, the, the new Glenn. Um, he's got the uh, the new Shepard already, which is the um, suborbital one, but he needs to develop this BE-4 engine so that he can start doing um, orbital um, um, uh, flights. Uh, rocket Lab, so we've seen the Electron rocket, um, but now we've got the Neutron rocket that's coming up soon, and that is going to be a 15-ton cargo capacity, uh, so that's going to be uh, quite a beast. Uh, along with this one as well, which is the uh, the, Sp the SpaceX Starship, which is hopefully going to make its first orbital flight in 2023. It was scheduled for back end of last year, but lots and lots of uh, delays meant that it's not going to be until next year. So that's what new technology we've got coming up. Um, but in terms of actual Russia itself, um, it's, it's already said that it's going to partner with the uh, the Chinese space agency because uh, China is the second uh, biggest uh, spender 
in space behind the US, uh, but it lacks the technologies. So uh, China have got the funds and uh, Roscosmos have got all of the technology. So between them, um, they're going to try and do this um, moon base, which will rival the gateway for lunar research. So in 2021, they agreed to build that. So this has been ongoing for uh, a few years now. Um, but China themselves, they had a record-busting year. So they uh, sent up over 50 rocket launches, which is uh, a record for them, a 100% success rate, which was amazing. Uh, and this year, or, or in 2022, this year that we're talking about, uh, they finished the construction of their Chinese space station, the, uh, the Qiangong space station, um, when they went absolutely full whack to get everything done that they needed to do in a total of six missions, which included two man, two cargo, and uh, two extra large module deliveries that were all sent up in that year. And as a, um, as a, a sort of a commemoration, they issued these coins that you can see here as a, a celebration of what they achieved. <clears throat> as for ESA, though, it's a little bit difficult for ESA. Um, so they've got the uh, the Soyuz is now out of the equation um, because of the, uh, the the conflict with Russia. You've got the small uh, launcher, which is the Vega, but it can only launch small um, payloads. But it suffered three failures in its last eight outings, and one of those, which is recently in December, was the newly launched Vega C. Um, and the Ariane 5 over here, which is a good workhorse, but it's looking to be replaced with the Ariane 6, which is due to make its maiden flight next year, um, which is OK as a, as a big rocket. But you don't really want to launch small payloads because it's not cost effective. It's like making pizza deliveries with an Arctic lorry. So they really do need a, a, a small launcher to go with it. So with all of that going on, there's... Um, pressure mounting over both the ESA launches and Ariane space. So again, we'll see how that pans out over the next 12 months. And we all got together on six separate occasions last year when we had our live launch parties. We saw um, the ATV up here, which is the other one I was talking about, the Antares rocket. So there was a resupply mission to um, and the ISS. Uh, on the right over here, we saw the um, Rocket Lab Electron rocket um, as the uh, the the first stage came back down and got captured by helicopter. Uh, they did let it go, but they called it a um, uh, a successful capture because they did capture it. Uh, they let it go for, for, for safety reasons. Uh, and then we saw the Boeing Starliner finally go up. So that's the uncrewed test in the bag. And the crew test will be happening in 2023. Um, we did sit there and see the first scrubbed test of the Artemis launch, which was in August. Um, where it was literally, oh, is it going to go? Is it going to go? No, the leak's too big. We'll have to wait. So it was wheeled back in and then wheeled back out. Uh, and eventually it did go. Um, probably the highlight for me was the dart impact. So it wasn't actually a live launch party, but we watched a spacecraft live crash into uh, um, an asteroid, the, uh, the double um, asteroid redirection test, which was a success as it crashed into the, uh, the Didymus system. And then eventually we did see the Artemis launch go up together. Uh, and I thank Tracy for taking command of the uh, the live launch party then as I had to go off to work and I managed to catch it in the car park just before I had to start work at seven o'clock on that morning. So that was a fantastic sight. So that is 2023 in the bag. Sorry, 2022 in the bag. 2023 is yet to come. Now, what you can see here are some of the uh, the main mission patches that uh, is going to be happening over the next 12 months. And these are some of the companies that are responsible for these missions taking place, uh, as well as NASA and ESA. So these are more sort of the, the commercial side of it. So that's really taking off. Um, we're going to be seeing the, um, the Psyche mission that will be going to 16 Psyche. So this is the um, metallic asteroid um, that... Uh, is going to give us a, a good indication of, uh, because it's the biggest metallic body, the only fully metallic body we would have ever visited, gives a good idea of the, uh, the, the core of our own planet and how that could have been formed. Um, and it'll answer a lot of the questions like, uh, is the core, is it the core of an early planet? How old it is? Was it formed in a similar way to the Earth's core? So that's due 
um, to, to to be launched in this year. We've also got the um, the Juice mission, the um, Jupiter icy moons explorers. So they are going to go to um, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and they're going to have some fantastic um, instruments on them, including an Earth penetrator. Uh, sorry, an ice penetrating radar um, that will be able to look through um, specifically the icy bodies and have a look to see what is underneath. Uh, and that will be um, uh, followed up later on in a couple of years by the uh, the NASA Clipper mission. So they'll work hand in hand to be able to give us some amazing detail. So that's due to go up in April. Um, we've got some, ma uh, some maiden flights of um, some new rockets, some of which I've already spoken about. Um, and you've noticed there that they've all got Amazon plastered all over them. And that's because Amazon has announced a deal with these uh, launch parties to deploy their constellation of satellites into low Earth orbit as part of their Project Kuiper, which is similar to the Starlink. So they'll be able to um, go up and uh, uh, give us some more sort of coverage and technology, um, but unfortunately more debris in space, actually. So um, more satellites coming your way, astronomers, I'm afraid. Uh, Ariane 6, as I mentioned already, is going to be making its maiden flight. Uh, that was delayed uh, from last year, and it's actually been delayed to Q4 this year. So we'll see how that goes. The Ariane 5 is still a good workhorse, though. Um, uh, the Juice was supposed to be the last mission that the Ariane 5 was due to send up, but because of this delay now to Q4, um, it's going to be uh, a lot more launches between now and the end of the year. And again, I also mentioned the new Glenn. So this will be uh, a step up from the new Shepard, which is only a suborbital one. So then Jeff Bezos will be able to start doing his orbital flights. Um, so that will be, uh, again, Q4, and it will all be depend on, on his BE4 engine, um, if he can get that going. Uh, this one I mentioned as well. This is the uh, the step up from the Atlas V. So this is the Vulcan Centaur. Um, the, 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 I've been told it's going to be sometime in 2023. That's the best I've got, and I have been looking today to see if I can get some more information. Uh, and if anybody does have any, just just post it on the um, uh, the Facebook page of the uh, the Open University, or send a tweet so we can all keep up with uh, the latest developments on all of these. But again, this is going to be reliant on Jeff Bezos developing his BE4 engine. So we'll see how that goes. Big year for um, Launch UK. We've already had uh, an attempt at the Virgin Orbit. Everything went perfectly apart from the second stage engine when it relighted. It cut out suddenly, uh, an anomaly as what it was called. Um, so no doubt they'll try again. Um, we've got Skyrora on the horizon. Whether that will be this year or not, I don't know. Uh, so that will be from the Shetland Islands. And then, of course, Orbex with their Prime, which will be from the north coast of Scotland, um, so hopefully we can um, start embracing UK launches as of this year. It's the maiden flight of the Starship, so it will be the most powerful rocket that we've ever launched into orbit. It will be able to generate more than twice as much thrust as the Saturn V rocket, and what a beast it is. We've all seen uh, the testing as it's going on. Uh, they've now tiled it so that it's uh, safe for re-entry, and then hopefully it will be able to go up and come back down uh, and do its orbital test at some point this year. <clears throat> I've already mentioned this as well. This is the um, Boeing Starliner um, crude test. So these are the two people that will be going on it. It will be Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams, both experienced um, astronauts. Both have done space shuttle missions. Both have done time on the ISS. Uh, and they're the, the Boeing Starline equivalent of Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley as they do their uh, mission, and it's targeted for April this year. So hopefully, timing's right, we'll be able to do a live launch party for that. <clears throat> India has been busy as well. They've been developing their own manned spaceflight module called the uh, uh, Gangyan. Uh, Gangyan. Gangyan. I can never know how to pronounce that properly. I'm sure someone will tell me at some point. Um, and it's their, uh, the, the, their very own um, crewed module, and they're hoping to complete its uncrewed test later on this year uh, with the first crude version in 2024. So we are going to be spoilt for choice 
with um, spacecraft being able to access low Earth orbit by the end of 2024, hopefully. <clears throat> also, a big year for Artemis. We had Artemis 1 that went around the moon very successfully uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but this year, they're going to announce the crew for the Artemis 2. So while the, um, uh, the personnel themselves haven't been announced, it's definitely confirmed that there will be um, someone from the CSA, um, from the Canadian Space Agency, as the first Canadian and non-American to travel uh, beyond low Earth orbit. And that's part of a treaty that the Americans and Canadians signed in 2020. So the Artemis II, they're going to announce the um, uh, crew this year, and then they'll hopefully be launching in 2024 all being well. Hopefully we haven't got the, uh, the, the similar delays that we had um, with the Artemis one. So if the Starship, the SpaceX Starship goes okay, we're going to be seeing this, which is a commercial uh, privately funded mission called Dear Moon. And what it will be is the first civilian mission to the moon. Um, and it's, it's funded by a Japanese entrepreneur and he's purchased all the seats aboard this rocket um, and um, he's announced eight crew members from across the world who will be going on this journey and they're all specific people that he's choosing. So he's choosing people from the creative world who can then come back and inspire us through their medium, whether they're a painter, a dancer, a novelist, and try and inspire everyone into um, a getting into the space industry and, and, and dragging some more people in. I understand there has been a short list, but I've heard nothing confirmed, and I don't think anything will be confirmed until the Starship actually makes its first flights. Until that happens, uh, this can't happen, but fingers crossed it will happen later on this year. So the idea is going to take just under a week, so you can see there the, the launch timeline down the bottom here. Uh, you've got the time in days, so it will go around the moon once and come back within about six days, five, five, five days, 23 hours and one minute uh, from um, takeoff to landing, uh, which is about the sorts of time it took for, for, for the lunar modules to go there and back. Because um, it takes, no, it's four days there, four days. Oh, it's a lot quicker than that. Wow. So, yeah, it's because of the size of it and it can go a lot faster. Um. I mentioned earlier about the uh, the CLPS, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. Now, these are uh, companies that NASA are working with, um, uh, American companies that are going to deliver um, lunar surface technology. So they are developing the landers. NASA have outsourced these, uh, and they'll be able to land them on the surface of the moon with instruments on board and um, be able to... Uh, use that data, ending, uh, getting companies to land these um, lunar modules onto the surface of the moon, uh, and they'll be collecting all of the data for them. And it's missions like this that the OU are designing their instruments that is going to be going on the moon. These are them then. So we've got uh, four that are scheduled for next year, and then there's one here for 2024. Uh, and um, for the Nova C, sorry, I'm getting uh, messages from Tracy. I'll read those afterwards because <laughs> she doesn't realise I'm in the middle of a talk. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so they are uh, some amazing piece of technology, and this is where NASA is now benefiting from outsourcing to all of these companies so that they can concentrate on doing what they do best with all of these mini clippers and the juices and the actual Artemis program itself. So, yes, we're all benefiting. Don't forget the aforementioned Luna that I was telling you about, the uh, Luna 25. That's due to uh, land in July this year in the South Pole, uh, and they are going to analyse lunar soil samples down there. The delayed Euclid, this was delayed because of the, uh, the Russian uh, invasion. Um, it's delayed to Q3, so this is a... Um, uh, a dark universe telescope so it'll be looking at um, dark matter dark energy uh, and, and taking measurements to be able to give us some insight into that um, so to understand dark energy and dark matter it's going to take measurements of both accelerated expansion of the universe and the strength of gravi gravi uh, gravity on cosmological scale 
So as you can see there, it will study it by two methods. The first is by observing the evolution of how galaxies have clustered together over the last 10 billion years or so, uh, give or take a billion. Uh, and the second is observing the distortion of galaxy images and using gravitational lensing uh, to see how ordinary matter is bent around. Um, and then they can use that data to give us a good insight. Uh, the Chinese, again, going to be busy. Um, this is the, um, now I can never pronounce this, Zunction, I think it's pronounced, I've heard it. Uh, but it's also known as, I like the, the, the easier name, the Chinese Survey Space Telescope, or the uh, the, the CSST. Um, so it's going to be launching in December 2023, hopefully. Uh, and it's going to be very, very similar to Hubble. It's going to have a, um, a two-meter diameter primary mirror, but it's going to be expected to be 300 to 350 times larger for the field of view than what Hubble is. But you can see it's going to work on a uh, a very, very similar principle there. And then some big, big news. The um, OSIRIS-REx um, sample is coming back from um, uh, Bennu. So when it took its sample, they were always worried about how much they were going to be able to collect. But it turned out, first go, because they collected so much, they had to ram the lid down. So I'm sure we've got a fantastic set of results coming back. Um, that's going to be coming back on um, the 24th of September, 2023. So just about four hours before uh, uh, atmospheric re-entry, it's going to release the, um, the SRC, the uh, sample return capsule. It's going to then come through the atmosphere. Uh, once it's safely through the atmosphere, it can then release its parachute to come down for a soft landing in the Utah desert where it will get collected. And it's um, the completion of a seven-year round trip to Manu and back. So we're all looking forward to that coming back. And uh, big news here, uh, Airbus are going to be sending the first metallic 3D printer into space. Now, we've already got um, 3D printers in there, but they use polymer. Uh, and they've been up there since 2014. Um, but the good thing about um, uh, the, the metallic one is... There's already metallic stuff up there, leftover satellites, leftover parts and stuff that they can then reuse and um, turn them into things. So to find out how difficult it is to actually 3D print in space, um, our very own Gary did a um, video for World Space Week last year, which you'll be able to find on our YouTube website, uh, telling you how the development of 3D printing has occurred in space using polymer. But uh, there's no sound on this. There is, but I've turned the sound off for you because sound doesn't work very well through the, uh, the Wix platform. Um, so you can see there, 3D metal printing in space. And it, there's some captions on here that you can read. But the difficulty is it's heat and it's a lot more energy that's needed to be generated, which is very, very difficult in space. And the first thing they need to do, learn how to melt metal in space so that they can reuse satellites and remake spare parts. So in the future, what they'll be able to do is they're able to make their own spare parts. So if they're out in space or something like that, uh, the other side of the moon, there we go. They'll be able to um, recreate what's um, done down on Earth to be able to um, uh, print their own spare parts because Earth will just have to send them the file and they press print. Uh, and with the metallic printer now, the, uh, the spare parts can be more sturdy. And finally, the last thing that we've got to think about 
is all of these space satellites that are going up. It's great that they're looking at the Earth as well because we've got lots of Earth observation satellites up there. Um, we've got lots of debris. And if we just keep putting things up and they say what goes up must come down, if we don't start bringing them down, then they're just going to get cluttered and we end up with um, uh, a really, really heavy space debris around us uh, with risks of collision and, of course, risk to uh, the technology that we have down here. Uh, and a fun fact that I've got up here, on average, 900 satellites to be launched every year by 2028. Now, you saw how many we were up to uh, 600 or so now uh, as the stats that I showed you at the beginning. And that's just going to get bigger and bigger as all of these things start ramping up. I'm not going to go too much into it because I know there's another talk coming up um, sometime in the next few weeks that will be advertised on the website, uh, which will be from uh, Rhea Urban. Some of you may know her. Uh, and she's going to be talking about space debris and claiming our skies back because it's not just making sure that we don't have satellites bumping into one another, but it's also clearing the sky so that astronomers can do what they like doing without having their um, vision spoiled by all of these things that are uh, are flying in and out and and um, uh, having a problem with their photos and all of their results that they're using. And that is it. So I thank you very much for your time.